Welcome to the Dark Waters Podcast, where the veil between the known and the unknown is thinner than you think. I'm your host, James Subsky, former volunteer search and rescue EMT, wildland firefighter, and mountain guide turned chief operating officer of Margie's Outdoor Store in Bingen, Washington. My life has been a journey through the wild, the unpredictable, and the unexplainable. Here in the heart of the Columbia River Gorge, I've encountered mysteries that defy explanation and phenomena that challenge our understanding of the world. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the shadows of the gorge, exploring stories of the supernatural, encounters with the unknown, and the legend that haunts these lands, the elusive Clickitat Ape. Join me as we unravel the secrets of the paranormal activity lurking in the Columbia River Gorge, share first-hand accounts of eerie encounters, and investigate the thin line between myth and reality. Whether you're a believer in the paranormal, a skeptic, or somewhere in between, the Dark Waters podcast promises to take you on a journey that will question everything you thought you knew about the natural and supernatural world. So buckle up, keep your flashlight close, and prepare to explore the dark waters of the unknown. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, and one and only James Williams, Dark Waters. And I'm back with another great interview. Uh, today I have James Shubsky with me, and we're going to talk about the Columbia River Gorge. Now, I'm telling you right now, this is about to be a great interview, because we're talking about all kinds of genetic experiments, escaped experiments. We're talking about Bigfoot. We talking about something that seems like it might be dog man, but not named dog man. We're talking about humanoids and little peoples. This is about to be fun. I mean, this is going to be insanely fun. So sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself because it's going down. Without any further ado, I bring in James Shupsky. James, how you feeling today, my friend? Great. Thanks for having me on. I'm happy to have you here with me. There's two Jameses here, so um, guys, y'all got the two Js. Two Js is in the building. Bro, start off with this right here for me. I'm, I'm going to hit you with the question I want to hit everybody else with. Somehow, people find themselves being fascinated with the paranormal or interested in the paranormal. How did you get to this point? Where did it start? Was it as a kid? Was it as a teenager? Was it as an adult? You know, how did you find <clears throat> yourself being interested in this field? Well, it's something that I've always been interested in. And, uh, you know, I was a uh, infantry soldier. I had some very interesting experiences there. Uh, wildland forest firefighter, search and rescue EMT mountain guide. I've had some unusual experiences uh, in wilderness areas. And uh, but what really sort of put me on this path was about three years ago, my mother-in-law passed away and she had a number of businesses in the Columbia River Gorge. And so my wife and I made the decision to carry on the family businesses. So we moved down here and uh, we had to reconfigure one of them and um, her, my mother-in-law's name was Margie. And so we turned uh, a store that she had into Margie's Outdoor Store. With all my outdoor experience, it sort of made sense for me to run that kind of a, a shop. Well, wasn't long after we sort of put up our signs and said we're an outdoor outfitter that people started coming in and telling us all kinds of amazing stories about their experiences in the wilderness areas around the Columbia River Gorge. And we were hearing stories about uh, Sasquatch, UFOs, portals, all kinds of really uh, out of the ordinary things. And what was amazing to me was it seemed like everyone who lived here either knew somebody or had had an experience themselves. So I put up a big sign in the window and it said, file your paranormal reports here. And I didn't know what we were gonna get. Well, we're about two years later, and we have had easily over 250 reports. And it's everything from glowing orbs, uh, classic UFOs, Bigfoot. Um, we've got this really interesting story about we've had over 80 reports alone on a creature we call the Clickitat Ape Cat, which is this enormous Black Panther creature that's been spotted in the county. And so that is really what put me on the path. Um, since then, you know, as I start to dig in some of these mysteries, I mean, you can imagine with 250 reports, it's a couple times a week, a new Scooby-Doo mystery walks through our door <laughs> and, uh -huh. um, it's really, really interesting stuff. And we're just now starting to see some patterns and some interesting data. We've got a lot of theories about why, uh, the gorge, which is 
one of the most geologically unique places in the country, why we have so many reports in this area. All right. So let's rewind a little bit. For those of us like me who are not sure where the gorge is, let's do like imagine you're above you and I floating <laughs> up in the sky. Tell us where it is so we can lock in. Sure thing. So um, Marge's Outdoor Store is located in Bend, Washington, and Bend in Washington is in southern Washington state. Uh, we are about 60 miles east of Portland, Oregon. All right. So the Columbia River forms the border between Washington state and Oregon state. So there's a bridge. It's maybe a mile long and uh, I can get right from my store into Oregon. Now, the gorge itself is a really remarkable area. Um, so the Columbia River is the largest river in North and South America that flows into the Pacific Ocean. It's been here for about 40 million years. So this is a really strong established current of energy flowing through the area. Now, uh, it's unique because it flows right through the Cascade Mountains. And in fact, it is the only sea level passage through those mountains. It's a very rare phenomenon on Earth. There's very few places like it. The western half of the gorge, which is about 80 miles long, um, is a Pacific Northwest rainforest. Uh, the eastern half sits in the rain, uh, rain shadow of the mountains, and it is a high plains desert. And so I start my day in Stevenson, Washington, where my home is. I drive about 25 minutes, and I start off in a Pacific Northwest rainforest, and I drive to the edge of the desert. That's great. Uh, me, yeah. So it is a stunningly beautiful place. It's so beautiful, in fact, that in the 1980s, uh, the U.S. Congress, in a rare moment of bipartisanship, designated it with a special protective status. It was the nation's first national scenic area. Basically, what that means is we're sort of like a national park, but all of the scenic viewways and things like that are protected. And so it's one of the few places where you can live in incredible beauty, um, park-like beauty, um, and still live and work and have businesses, um, but it's also got that unique protection. So some of the things that make this place incredible is that in a half a mile, you can go from basically sea level at the river um, to 3,000 3, feet. Uh, there are steep cliffs all over the place. We have over 90 named waterfalls on the Oregon side alone, which is the highest concentration of waterfalls anywhere in the United States. Some of these waterfalls are over 600 feet tall. Um, you uh, move around the gorge. Uh, there are just stunning rock formations. Uh, we've got probably over 600 caves out here. It's a world famous um, windsurfing and kiteboarding location. Uh, you got whitewater rafting, mountain climbing, rock climbing, hiking. Pretty much it's a, an adventure wonderland. So an astonishing place um, in its history, geologic history, is really, really unique. Um, and, you know, we can get into some of that in a minute, but I can tell you that when you look at government maps of the gorge, there are these bright pink letters on it that say, warning, your magnetic compass readings are going to be off in this area. And that has to do with um, how the gorge was formed. Uh, it's a pretty astonishing story. About 16 million years ago, an enormous fissure opened in the earth. It was 97 miles long right at the Washington-Idaho border. And giant volumes of lava just started erupting out of this thing. Uh, so much lava erupted out of this thing, this giant fissure, that if you spread it out evenly over the lower 48 states, it would bury the entire United States in 60 feet of lava. Wow. And this rock, um, it, they, were, they estimate over 300 different eruptive events. And what so when you get to the gorge you see this layer cake like each of those different lava flows and that lava flowed 300 miles through the ancient columbia river valley all the way to the pacific ocean well as each one of those um that lava flowed in and when it was still soft the magnetic material in it the iron and whatnot oriented towards the earth's magnetic north pole then maybe ten thousand years pass another lava flow comes in and at this point, the Earth's magnetic uh, North Pole has moved. And so the second layer is going to point towards the new magnetic North. You know, like our North Pole in the last 100 years has moved 700 miles, right? right? So it's a pretty significant difference. 
So what that means is that each layer has a unique magnetic signature. It's a very unusual system. Then about 2 million years ago, we had the Cascade Mountains rise up. So literally the mountain, the, the river is older than the mountains. And you have mountains like Mount Rainier, Mount Hood, Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens, Mount Shasta. These are all Cascade Peaks, all over 10,000 10, feet tall. And they took those layers and then they bent them. And so now these magnetic layers are now at weird angles to each other. And then uh, some of your listeners may have heard of, you know, Graham Hancock or maybe Randall Carlson talking about these younger Dryas floods. So about 15,000 years ago, there was this um, ice age lake that was formed. They say it was trapped behind a glacier dam formed in Missoula, Montana. Well, in a single day, that dam catastrophically collapsed. And the volume of water equal to all the Great Lakes combined rushed across Washington State, eastern Washington State. The water, uh, as it came across Washington State, was over 300 feet deep. It's the most epic flood that uh, we're aware of in the history of the Earth. And this all got trapped at the um, eastern edge of the gorge, a place called Balula Gap. And then it started shooting down the gorge. And in some places in the gorge, like where my store is, um, those waters were over a thousand feet deep and That's it crazy. absolutely scoured the landscape. Nothing was left, nothing lived and completely reset the gorge. But basically what it did was it scraped away all of the topsoil, the trees, all the forests and those magnetic layers, which would normally be hidden are now all exposed like a live wire. And there's some really interesting theories about how, uh, because our brains contain magnetite crystals, uh, this is a 100% verified scientific fact, that um, in our hippocampus and our temporal lobes, they estimate there to be uh, 5 million uh, magnetite crystals per gram of brain matter. And this is what allows animals to navigate um, with a magneto sense. And in the 1980s and 90s, a guy named Dr. Michael Persinger up in Laurentine University in Ontario, Canada, did studies about what happens when you uh, manipulate magnetic fields around a human's brain. And a whole range of perceptions uh, emerge. People have a sense of uh, sense presence. Uh, they, he created this helmet. Um, it's like a motorcycle helmet with these solenoids on it. And in the media, they called it the God helmet because a number of his um, study uh, participants claimed to have seen God while he was manipulating these magnetic fields. And so, you know, like I said, we have this, we way over index in terms of the amount of uh, paranormal reports we receive in the gorge. It's an enormous number. You know, I'm just one storefront and in two years we've gathered over 250 reports. But it's not just me. Um, Washington State has the highest per capita UFO sightings anywhere in the country and the highest per capita Bigfoot sightings anywhere in the country. And I really believe that, uh, and of course, here in the gorge, like we're sort of the beating heart of that stuff. Um, the very first like UFO sighting that became popularized was the Kenneth Arnold sighting. I believe it was in June of 1947. He was flying a private plane across the Cascade Mountains, and it started, uh, he saw nine saucer-shaped craft. Basically, he flew from the north past his location near Mount Rainier, and right towards uh, Mount Adams, which is a part of the, the Gorge Geologic Complex. Uh, and Mount Adams is very famous UFO uh, hotspot. And so from the very beginning of the UFO flying saucer phenomenon in America, this area has been right at the center of that. And then of course, many, many, many of the uh, Bigfoot stories that you hear uh, come right out of this area. Basically in the Washington side, there are two counties uh, there's Klickitat County, which is where my store is located, and Skamania County, which is where my home is located. And Skamania County was the very first government agency anywhere in the world to actually legally protect Sasquatch. And if you shoot a Sasquatch here in Skamania County, uh, you're going to be charged with a felony. I'm going to stop you. I want to ask you, I want to rewind and ask you a question. So are we saying that the working theory, this was the working theory came up in my mind, James, is that because of these magnetic lines and this, the, the magnetic fields, people have the ability to see the UFOs and all the paranormal activity 
more in that area versus other areas because of the unique structure in that area with the magnetic uh, fields. That makes a hell of a lot of sense if that's what you're saying. It is what I'm saying. Very studio you to pick up on that. So you think about like um, a radio station. Say you're listening to a classic music station, right? Mm -hmm. You have to tune the receiving apparatus to that station right. to yep. pick up that information. It's existing in the world. You normally don't see it. It's only when you get your tuner and you set it up right that you're going to be able to listen to classical music. Simultaneously, there's talk radio, there's classic rock, there's hip hop, mm -hmm. there's all these different stations being broadcast. By simply adjusting that tuner, Frequent. very slight yeah. electromagnetic adjustment, you're suddenly able to perceive things that have always been there, but you weren't didn't have access to because you weren't tuned to them. What I think is happening out here in the gorge is that this is such a magnetically electromagnetically active area that um, people's tuners are automatically getting adjusted. And, you know, it, it can also be influenced thing like by things like uh, solar weather, whether that's impacting the Earth's magnetosphere. It might even have to do with the types of things you ate that day. You know, maybe more potassium in your diet will adjust some of these um, chemical levels in your brain or whatever. And so you're perceiving things that uh, I would argue are always there, but you're just not tuned to being able to perceive them. You know, we have tons and tons of co-witnessed reports. So these are reports where there are multiple people seeing the same thing. I have a group of six whitewater rafting guides that for half an hour watched an enormous egg-shaped UFO float in the sky. Um, and so six people all having the same experience, very clear visual perception. We have photographic evidence. So I myself have taken pictures of glowing orbs and some of the more tectonically stressed areas of the gorge. Uh, and I've seen them with the naked eye as well. We have obviously tons of footprints in the area. One of the most uh, significant uh, Bigfoot castings, it's called the Skookum cast, occurred uh, on the flanks of Mount St. Helens. And this is a cast where it's not just a foot. Uh, apparently the creature sort of laid down on its side to grab some fruit that they had placed in the middle of like a big mud puddle essentially. And they have imprints of its buttocks, its hips, its, you know, forearm and part of its heel, all with things like dermal ridges and stuff like that. So the kind of things that you would expect to see, uh, dermal ridges are like fingerprints, but you have those on your heels and in other parts of your body. And so we have this enormous amount of physical evidence. I've got folks who brought in uh, Sasquatch hair samples into the store. Uh, we've taken castings and footprints of that nature. So it's really clear that whatever is happening here, um, first of all, there is a, uh, a data recording component to it. Uh, it's not something which is a hallucination in one person's mind. You can't take pictures of hallucinations. People don't uh, co-witness hallucinations. Hallucinations right. are an individual personal thing. Um, but again, these are creatures that are not recognized by science. They're uh, infrequently seen or seen under only certain unusual conditions. And so if we're being reasonable and logical about it, we have to say, okay, there's uh, obviously the human apparatus is limited in terms of what it can perceive. Like we all recognize that dogs can hear sounds that we can't hear, that there is infrared and ultraviolet light that we normally can't see with our eyes. And that's no reason to think that there aren't other energetic modes that we're just currently not tuned to. And so my my best theory is that it has to do with this incredibly complex and unique electromagnetic environment. You know, we talked about all that geology, but think about this. There are 14 hydroelectric dams on the Columbia River. They generate 44% of all of the hydroelectric power in the United States. And they send that power via these, you know, uh, transmission lines. lines, these high power transmission mm -hmm. lines. And those are sort of crisscrossing the whole area. And oftentimes many of these reports that we get are within a hundred yards of some of these high power transmission lines. Mm -hmm. And again, to me, that's all speaking to a, um, an electromagnetic, electromagnetic field. Uh -huh. yeah. Huge electromagnetic fields are created by those. I mean, absolutely enormous. Yeah. I think the thing that really, the clue that really tipped it off for me. So I talked about Dr. Michael Persinger up at Laurentine University. And 
he was experimenting with manipulating fields, uh, magnetic fields around a person's brain. And one of the things that they were able to do was turn fear on like a switch. Like um, if they set it to a particular setting, people would suddenly feel like they were in abject terror. No build up to it, no story associated with why you're scared. Suddenly you just feel terrified. So we had uh, in the spring of this year, excuse me, spring of last year, someone sent me a picture of what looked like a classic tic-tac-shaped UFO over Underwood Mountain. Underwood Mountain's maybe three, four miles from the store. And, you know, we did a little image enhancement. The picture was taken from 12 miles away, but it looks just like one of those tic-tacs that you see on the gun cameras from the fighter jets, right? Uh, no uh, wings, no props, that kind of stuff. And the best that we could say about it was that it's a possible UFO, um, but had all those characteristics. Now, at the base of Underwood Mountain, where right at the river level, I took a picture of a blue glowing orb. And, um, you know, we talked to different photographic experts. It is 100% not a lens flare. Um, and it's not headlights. There are vehicles in the picture that do have headlights, and it's clearly not that. Uh, and so, again, this is another phenomenon where we've got some type of photographic evidence of it. But in the middle of Underwood Mountain, there's a number of vineyards. So this area is very favorable for growing wine. That's why I'm going to stop right there. That's why I was wondering. I got a report, and I was wondering, same place of a Bigfoot sighting at a vineyard. I was just getting ready. I wrote it down. Ask him about the vineyards in the area. <laughs> I couldn't remember it because it was like Columbia's Gorge. I was like, I yeah. think somebody told me about Bigfoot. That's crazy. So I literally just got a sighting out of the area about that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, oh, you sure. So we got a report. A guy came in. What's interesting is that, you know, um, in the store, I set up some policies and I said, you know, we are going to be a safe place for people to file these kind of reports. Um, you know, knowing that uh, oftentimes if people have an unusual experience, they're reluctant to talk about it. And so I said, we're going to treat everyone who walks in with respect and dignity. We're going to ask intelligent follow-up questions. We're going to treat their experience as though it was rare, but real. And, you know, you could say, oh, you're going to get fooled. People are going to come in and, you know, tell tall tales. And honestly, no harm, no foul. You know, I'm not a scientific body. I'm not trying to prove anything. But I know, and it turns out that there's not that many people who come in and are being silly. I mean, obviously there's a few folks, but... For the most part, the people who come in are pretty earnest, and their stories honestly aren't that interesting. Like, I saw it run across the road, and that was it. Um, but the main thing is that I really wanted to ensure that this was a place where people felt like they could talk about these experiences without fear of being ridiculed or laughed at or, you know, given side eyes or whatever, and just to take it seriously, take in the data, see what comes of it. And so this guy came in, and like I said, he lived in one of the vineyards on Underwood Mountain. So at the top of Underwood Mountain, we've got the Tic Tac. At the bottom, we've got this uh, glowing orb. And he said that he saw two red glowing orbs sort of um, almost dancing in the sky, leapfrogging each other. They descended to the earth. They started moving across his vineyards towards him. And suddenly, he said, like a switch was thrown, I felt terrorized. So he ran into his house, grabbed his shotgun came back out and by the time he came back out the phenomenon had ended and it was that note of that he felt terror like a switch was thrown that harkened me back to the uh, studies done by dr michael persinger and that's really where i began to think you know i think that these phenomena are related and so here we've got an area of high tectonic stress let me stop you real quick i want to ask you a question i'm gonna stop you did he describe or did he give any grabs of the that electromagnetic signal or how it was shaped when those people experienced that fear in his research. Did he graph it out so you could see what it looks like? Did he give any measurements of it? Because I'm willing to bet you that if we take that exact signature, however it's measured, which I'm, I'm pretty sure I know how they're measured, and then you compare it to an eyewitness uh, in Louisiana, and they find themselves being made afraid in their bedroom at night in the dark when they're all alone, you're going to get that same electromagnetic frequency in both locations. I'm, I'm yeah, convinced that that's what would happen. You're absolutely right. Uh, very astute of you to, to make that connection because that's exactly the kind of connections that Dr. Persinger was making. And he found that not only did people feel terrorized, but they also 
sensed a presence in their room. There's a number of other things that are, you know, might be called classic abduction phenomenon that people were feeling. Um, and so whatever is going on here, um, you know, again, because we have so much physical evidence, it really leads me to believe that somehow these, um, we're talking about an independent reality, something that is persistent. It's not localized to one person's brain or, you know, hallucinatory experience. And we're accessing things that we just normally aren't tuned to. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's been a really amazing adventure for us to sort of uh, be receiving these reports. And honestly, it's so much fun. I mean, I, I know some people get kind of creeped out about this stuff, but for me, uh, I absolutely love living here and, and sort of being at ground center, ground zero for a lot of this stuff because so much of the world, uh, people have already think they know the answers. And here's a place where there are some legitimate mysteries going on. You know, there are things out here that um, we don't understand. And the, you know, the people who wave their hands and, you know, dismiss it as nothing really aren't looking at the totality of the evidence. But boy, it sure is exciting and fun to be, um, you know, participating in this and starting to try to make sense of it. Uh, it's one of those fields where scientists aren't touching it for taboo reasons, you know, reasons that involve their funding and their professional reputations. I don't have that concern. Uh, for me, it's just an exciting uh, avenue of exploration of what is going on out here and how can we learn more about it? You know, that's the thing about this field. You find that there's two sides to the coins. There's guys like me and you who we enjoy it. We look at it from a scientific standpoint, but we're not scientists. And then when you meet with a scientist, you know, like I just did an interview with a scientist about UFOs that's releasing a date. I could tell by the conversation we were having that he knew everything I was talking about, but he would not acknowledge any of it. He kept <laughs> looping me in the conversation. He had a go-to line when he was like, yeah, you know, if I could prove the aliens existed, man, that would be good for my funding. I'm like, that's the first time you said that. By the fourth time he used that loop to get out of a question, I just gave up. I said, okay, this guy doesn't want yeah. to risk the ridicule, and I'm not going to press him because it's unfair to him because his livelihood is, is you know, is based on it. And exactly. you find that that's what's going on. They know, bro. It's not like they don't know. They know. They just can't yeah. come out of their academia and talk about it. And that's the that's the problem. Yeah. They know probably way more than we'll ever think that they know. Now, this doctor, <laughs> is he still alive or did he die? Uh, he, he passed away, I think, in 2014. 2014. We will be doing yeah, a deep Michael dive Persinger. on that research. Yeah. We'll be doing a deep dive on that research because that's that's phenomenal. Let me Let me rewind again. All right, let's go back to the store. We understand um, that you have the store. Talk to me. Are you giving tours out of that store, or is it just is it just the outdoor store where people come in and get their equipment? I mean, how is that outside of the, taking the reports? How is it blending in in other ways into the area into the paranormal activity? Do you take people out to certain places where eyewitnesses have seen things? Anything like that? That's a great question. Uh, so. You know, when we first started getting this information in, um, I really wasn't sure what we were going to do with the data. And uh, you can see behind me, um, there's a map of the Columbia River Gorge. That's one that I hand drew myself. And so uh, now I've started to populate that. We've got a giant version of that in the store. We put push pins in it, you know, so people know what's going on uh, or where these reports are coming from. Uh, we also have... Um, there are a couple different ways to interact with what we're doing. You get margiesoutdoorstore.com where we've got some information about some of the creatures and uh, different phenomena that are going on out here. Margie's Outdoor Store on Facebook and YouTube. We put up information there. Uh, I've produced a couple of what we call arcane adventure maps. These are sort of like uh, self-guided tours of some of the paranormal hotspots. One of the ones that's really interesting is called uh, Horse Thief Butte. It looks like a desert mesa. Um, but when you get into it, it's riddled with a labyrinth of hidden passageways and natural amphitheaters. There are petroglyphs on the walls. And um, so lots of really interesting stuff going on there. Lots of reports in that area. And then another area that uh, we have an arcane adventure map for is called Beacon Rock. This is the second largest monolith in the northern hemisphere. It's a giant extinct volcano, 840 feet tall. It's got a um, 
a trail that's actually pinned to the side of the cliffs and you you know go through all these tunnels and caves and switchbacks and everything to get to the top easy enough like i take my dog up there we see kids up there all the time but uh, beacon rock has got uh, a whole history in and of itself of strange paranormal phenomena we hear about uh the maintenance workers at the park talk about seeing ghostly apparitions at the equestrian trailhead and uh, the group campsite in particular. Uh, we've heard stories of glowing orbs in this area and uh, many, many Sasquatch uh, reports. And Beacon Rock is just maybe a mile away from one of the largest uh, hydro dams. We have the Bonneville Dam. From the Bonneville Dam, we've also had reports of UFOs and people who work at some of the bridges that cross the uh, river in that area, you know, going back even to the 1970s, talk about seeing enormous UFOs just coming down the uh, the river valley. So, um, so you asked about the store and what we're doing. Uh, we've got uh, the big maps. We've got a number of sort of, I guess you'd call them, um, oh, displays or exhibits where people can look at uh, some of the stuff that's going on, and we're. I'm just on the verge of uh, getting a uh, sort of a paranormal club in the area. So people who are interested, um, we can get together and talk about, uh, you know, recent reports and, uh, you know, put together investigations, get a little more serious about it. Again, this is the kind of thing that's evolving. And um, it's been really, really uh, very gratifying and satisfying to be a part of it and sort of be at the center of it all. You have any limited edition maps, anything like that, that um, you have a limit on that somebody will like take as buy as a collectible? <laughs> you know, we sell this this big one in the store. Um, mm -hmm. That's available. Uh, we haven't, uh, we don't have enough of anything to limit it. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm well, happy just to, thing. yeah, happy to sell them as is without, uh, you know, doing a collectible kind of thing out of it. But. Well, I'll tell you now, there's plenty of people, and I promise you, my audience will tell you, there's plenty of people who will buy a collectible map of Bigfoot sightings and locations in the area, because that's one of the things that um, we pride ourselves on, is actually being able to put a pin in the map as to where something happened. That's how you collect the data points on what's really going on. Like, for example, you can, I'm pretty sure by you getting eyewitness encounters, you understand this. The average encounter is, I saw something crossing the road. I heard a noise. I saw something behind a bush. There's normally not these epic encounters where Bigfoot is chasing them down the road and ripping a bumper yeah. off and punching through yeah. the window. It doesn't happen that way. Those are like one in a million almost, right? But the data set of, okay, there was a sighting here, 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 here. It has tremendous value for people who want to be researchers because they can't get to that location, but they yeah. can definitely collect it as research. I'm just bringing it up as a point. It's a good idea for you guys to yeah, Put and I think, online. you know, we're, we're getting ourselves a little bit more sophisticated in that regard and, and putting together some of those programs. We've had those requests of people looking for the stuff, and it's just a question of, you know, I'm running uh, this business and a couple others and, you know, trying to <laughs> keep all those balls in the air and make sure I'm able to pay everybody. Um, you know, some of these things take back burner kind of stuff. I got but, you. Uh, let's, let's just switch uh, gears. I want to know about some of the things that are actually active around there. So I know we have this giant cat that has a monkey face that sounds like a dog man, which we call dog man. Does that thing stand up on two legs or is it always on all four? Let's just get that out of the way. All right. So you're talking about the click a tad ape cat. And we yeah, have had over 80 reports of this enormous, very mysterious black panther-like creature creeping around the Columbia River Gorge. Um, so, you know, as we compile these reports, some of them go back to 1968. Um like I said, 80 different reports. Just got one today, in fact, a new report up by Mount St. Helens. And so of these reports, all of them describe this large, very muscular black cat with a long black tail. Um, and that's really kind of one of the key characteristics. Obviously, we have black bear out here and we've got cougars. But when we talk to the wildlife professionals, uh, they will tell you that there is no such thing as a black cougar, right? Cougars are either sort of a tawny tan and when they express their melanin they go to more of a reddish color but no scientist recognizes um black cougars in north america the only big black cat in north america is the jaguar as a when it's in a black melanistic form 
but their range is a thousand miles south of Klickitat County. So the idea that there is a black cat running around in Klickitat County, even if it's just a mutant black cougar, is national news. So everyone talks about that, and the really the defining characteristic, the way we know it's not a bear or a cow or something like that, is this cat-like tail, <laughs> and then these sort of feline body shape and feline movements. In fact, over the summer, we got a, a video. It's a crappy uh, Facebook video of a couple that caught it at the uh, west end of the gorge on, on film. You know, you look at the thing, and it's a spot kind of crawling around in the background, but uh, it would be what I call conclusive evidence. So 80 reports, large black cat. About half of those reports, including the one that came in the store today, uh, say that this creature is enormous in size. So by that, I mean four to five feet tall at the shoulder. Uh, so normally, a cougar is not going to be more than 24 inches tall at the shoulder. So at the shoulder, meaning, you know, when it's walking along, you know, the head can go up and down, but the shoulder sort of where they measure it from. Uh, even tigers aren't that big. So this is a beast of enormous proportions. Um, the fossil record only indicates that there is one creature uh, that was ever a cat of this size. Um, it was an Ice Age cat called the uh, uh, American Lion or um, Panthera atrox. And this was the largest cat that ever lived on Earth. Um, there's a really solid fossil record of it. It absolutely lived in Washington State um, 10,000 years ago. Um, and among its characteristics, it was over a thousand pounds and it had the largest brain pan of any cat that ever lived. So um, but outside of the panther atrox, there's nothing that describes a creature, a cat-like creature that is four to five feet tall at the shoulder. And then there's a handful of reports that say that um, this creature has a face that looks like a monkey. And that's one of the ones where, you know, I always keep an open mind, but I, when I first heard that, I, it, it's kind of arresting. Like, how does that even work? What does it look like? Uh, the first guy who came in, the very first report we ever got, a guy was uh, navigating, you know, orienteering up near Buck Creek, probably four or five miles, not far from Underwood Mountain, in fact. And his compass started acting weird. Shortly thereafter, he looked up across the creek, and there is this enormous black cat-like creature sitting across the creek looking at him. Um, and he's the first one to describe it having a monkey-like face. He said the best way I can describe it is cross between a cat and a monkey, intelligent ape-like eyes, and some other primate features. He watched the cat for, he says, close to five minutes. And so he got a really clear look at it. It was completely unafraid of humans. And we hear that again and again in many of the reports that the creature does not seem to fear human beings. Really rare because normally a cougar is going to, would um, will abandon a fresh kill just at the sound of human voices. So the fact that there's a cat uh, looking at somebody and not running away, very unusual. So when I first got this report, you know, the guy, um, this was not long after uh, I took over the store and <clears throat> um, it took him about 45 minutes to work up the courage to tell me what he had experienced because it's such an unusual thing. And he also had a family connection with my mother-in-law, so not quite a friend of the family, but someone who was familiar to the family. So in my mind, it was a, kind of a credible report. You know, um, one report doesn't, you know, mean a whole lot. Uh, it's just, right. okay, well, interesting data point. Where does it go from here? Um, but yeah, he described four to five feet tall shoulder, black fur, monkey-like face. So I was really excited the next day. I, was talking to my employees and as I described the creature one of my employees Missy started shaking um and I said are you okay I mean what's going on here and she said oh my god James I have seen that thing myself and she was driving down Clickitat Canyon at dawn she saw this enormous cat-like creature on the side of the road uh, she even stopped her car to watch it and uh, eventually it walked into a small patch of tall grass and then she never saw it again and she wondered if she should, you know, talk to the homesteads nearby to warn them that there's this enormous black predator uh, in their area. She decided against that. And it's kind of a good thing because when she described this creature to her family, um, they told her that she had probably seen a cow. 
So think about that. Like, here's a grown woman. You're going to tell us a cow. <laughs> yeah. And you don't know the difference between a cow and a giant black cat. Like, it's it's like if you <laughs> saw a Ferrari, a red Ferrari driving down the street, and you told your family, hey, I saw a red Ferrari. It's like, ah, red Ferraris are pretty rare. What you probably saw was a minivan. It's like, right. it's ridiculous on its face. But, you know, the sort of pushback and kind of joking ridicule that she got, she just clammed up about it and never talked about it again. Uh -huh. And once I described this creature to her, she said, oh, my God, you know, this is something that I've experienced myself. And so Missy's a really honest person. No reason to suspect that she was, you know, making this up or anything like that. So at that point, I realized we've got something to talk about here. So obviously the store's got, you know, an advertising budget. So I put up some radio ads asking, you know, has anyone seen this cat? Uh, put some flyers at some of the trailheads and things of that nature. And reports started flooding in. A lot of them really unexciting. You know, um, I was driving my ATV, a giant black cat jumped across the trail, scared the crap out of me and I never saw it again. So a lot of stuff like that. We've had a report, a guy saw it in his driveway and it had a kit with it, you know, a youngling. So the this this thought that these things are reproducing uh obviously if, if you're seeing young um we had uh one hunter that saw it in the scope of his rifle decided not to shoot because he wasn't sure it was an endangered animal or not um we've had reports of it swimming in the columbia river and uh up in trees in the area senior law enforcement officials tell me they've seen it and so there's this uh, really large body of uh, field reports. And, you know, you, I'm trying to make sense of it. And as I'm going along, like, I won't hear that monkey face description for a while. And then someone will come in who's really credible. Like I talked to a uh, wildland uh, forest fire crew chief, and they were deployed up between Mount Adams and Mount St. Helens. Um, these are two strata volcanoes that are within 35 miles of the store. And they were fighting forest fires up there. The whole crew saw uh, this giant black cat with a monkey-like face, and they wondered what the hell they were going to do if it ever showed up in their camp. Uh, they were on a three-day deployment. So what's interesting is we have reports that go back all the way to 1968. That's the uh, earliest report that I've received. Uh, there are no hostile re uh, encounters reported. No one ever says this thing attacked me or it attacked my pets or anything like that which is a really curious uh, data point as well. Um, many folks report feeling like they're in the presence of something special or unusual uh, when they encounter it. What's interesting is that the woman who was the fire crew chief said um, her description of the monkey-like face was a little more helpful. She said that, <clears throat> you know how like a, like a German shepherd has got a long snout, but a pug dog has got a shortened, flattened face? Yeah. And her description was more like pugs and German shepherds are both dogs. It's just one has got a more compressed facial structure. Right. And, you know, you can imagine that, um, that there may be some type of uh, thing going on there where it's, you know, just a more of a uh, different facial build than you normally see. And so people have this perception. that looks like a monkey to them. Again, um, I'm trying to make sense of the data that's coming into me. I haven't seen it. Uh, I haven't seen its face myself. And so really hard to sort of ascertain what we're looking at. We do know that um, like the Panthera atrox had uh, a great degree of sexual dimorphism. That means that uh, males and females are different sizes. And so uh, many of the reports that we get, like close to half of them, uh, that it's sort of a more of a regular sized cougar sized animal. But then like the guy we talked to today, he saw it jump across the road and he said that it was nearly as big as his Honda Civic. Um, and so just an absolutely enormous creature. So there's some questions like, all right, well, we've got a lot of credible folks reporting with field reports of this phenomenon. You can either say they're all liars, which is not a, a theory I accept. It just doesn't make sense, right? Why would there be 80 people lying about this thing, um, putting themselves out, uh, and especially given the responses of people that I know personally and, and their reactions to it, I think that we're genuinely talking about actual field sightings. 
So you look around, what are some other explanations? Well, um, there is a Native American tradition of a race of supernatural panther protectors. It's a race of what they, they say they come from the underwater realm. And they're called in the Great Lakes area, Meshepishu. And so these are this race of beings that are, they look like black panthers and they come from the outer, underwater realm. When Native Americans talk about things coming from the sky realm or from the underwater realm or from the underground realm, they're talking about beings that have a foot in the spirit world and the physical world. That's those sort of transitional type of beings, mm -hmm. um, which sounds a lot like the types of things we we're talking about earlier in the show. What's interesting about the story of the Meshepishu is that one description I read says that it looks like a black panther with the face of a man. And so um, interesting correlation there. Now here in the Columbia River Gorge, there are tons of petroglyphs. So these are uh, rock paintings and rock etchings. Uh, and over by that Horse Thief Butte area that I was talking about earlier, there is this really fabulous image of a cat-like creature uh, you know, big ears, uh, eyes, long teeth. Uh, and under its head, there are these wavy lines uh, looking like water. Water. Uh, and then coincidentally, there's a crack running through the water. And so uh, it may be that the inhabitants of the Columbia River Gorge have been experiencing a creature like this for millennia. We just don't know. Um, there's another interesting lead. So uh, just south of Mount Adams, maybe 20 minute drive from our store, there's a place called the ESETI Ranch. ESETI stands for Enlightened Contact with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And for decades, Jim Gilliland has opened up his property. Uh, people come from all over the world and they watch UFOs fly around Mount Adams all night. And people come as skeptics and they leave believers. And so you can go to ESETI.org and the first thing you'll see is their logo, which looks like a lion faced, uh, there's a lion face on there. And one of the races of extraterrestrials that they claim to be in contact with is a race of feline humanoids. Um, so I haven't had a chance to talk with them in detail about this, but you know, there's another possibility where locally there is a group of individuals that claim to be in contact with feline humanoids. Sounds a lot like kind of what we're talking about. But interestingly, the most rational explanation for where these giant black panther creatures are coming from is that they escaped from the Hanford nuclear site just up river from us. And so Hanford was a part of the Manhattan Project, which got started way back during uh, World War II. And um, when you walk through the facts and the data, it's remarkable that that may be the most reasonable explanation for where this thing is coming from. I'm sorry, I think I'm mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. So are we saying nuclear um, genetic mutations, normal mutations, or are we saying genetic experiments? What are we saying when we start talking about this? We talking about I think we're talking about genetic, genetic experiments. And so oh, let me walk okay. you through sort of the history of that whole program. So World War II, um, Einstein writes a letter to the president worried about the Nazis unlocking the secrets of the atom. They take him seriously. So they spin up the Manhattan Project. So everyone right. knows that there's Oppenheimer down in Los Alamos, and he is working with the engineers, and they're designing the bomb. But over in Hanford, the U.S. government needed a place where they could set up uh, the first industrial-scale nuclear reactors, and they chose Hanford, which is along the Columbia River. They basically evicted all the people who were living on a 600 square mile area of land that had 45 miles of the Columbia River running through it. It's really close to a new hydroelectric dam up there. They knew that they needed the electricity from the dam and the water from the river to cool the reactors and power the whole facility. And they needed a place that was remote enough and far enough away from the coast that it couldn't be bombed, you know, by Nazis or Japanese people or whatever. And so they spun up this Hanford nuclear site. Um, eventually, you know, after we won the war and the Cold War started, 
they produced enough plutonium there to build 60,000 nuclear weapons. It's often referred to as the apocalypse factory because it is it was our number one nuclear site. And so um, during World War II, it's top secret. They've got a whole army of 40,000 people who build this city overnight. They build the reactors. They get everything going. And from day one, they had a biologist there. And his name um, was uh, Dr. Lauren Donaldson. Look, the only thing that Dr. Lauren Donaldson, he was from the University of Washington, the only academic accomplishment he had ever done was he had created a, a super animal. So it's called the Donaldson super trout. This is a fish that is eight times larger and stronger than a normal fish. And it reaches sexual maturity in half the time. It can swim in salt water and fresh water. It's super survivable. It's a very tough creature. They use it even today to stock fisheries. And so he's the guy that they put in charge of the animal testing program at Hanford from the very beginning. And you got to ask yourself why? Well, the Nazis were super interested in creating super soldiers and super animals. Um, there are really credible reports. They had actually resurrected an extinct ice age creature called the aurochs. It's a gigantic hyper aggressive bull. And through retro breeding and a number of other Nazi programs, they actually brought this creature, this ice age creature back to life and they populated an entire forest in Poland with them. And so, the allies are looking at that and, you know, back in the forties, we knew that radiation could induce mutations, but we didn't know a, a whole lot more than that. In fact, the Hanford biology program is where we know most of our information about what effects radiation has on biological creatures. And so Donaldson is in there during the war. He's, you know, studying fish and doing whatever he was doing there. Uh, the, we dropped the, we do the Trinity test. It was Hanford plutonium that, um, is using the first nuclear detonation in the history of mankind. And then uh, it was also used in the Nagasaki bomb. And so then they announced Hanford to the world. They say, yep, Hanford was what saved America. Well, then the uh, Russians start scooping up Nazi scientists. So we start scooping up Nazi scientists. They clamp down. The whole site again becomes a top secret site. Donaldson winds up going to the South Pacific and he's a part of like the Castle Bravo test and the Bikini Atoll test and all that crazy stuff that went on down there. And he stays in touch with the new guy at Hanford, a guy named Bill Bear. So Bill Bear is a World War II highly decorated veteran specializing in amphibious warfare. And he gets put in charge of the animal testing lab. Well, during the Cold War, Hanford, this this animal testing lab balloons to this enormous size and they can house a thousand large animals there at a time. And what they're saying they're testing is things like what happens to like, if a cow gets interacts with fallout, can you still drink their milk? Or like, can you wear you know, wool clothing from sheep that have been irradiated? Like what are those kind of things is what they say their program is all about, but they continue to do this crazy testing. Now, Bill Baird died Oh, probably 2017. And Hanford closed down in the 80s. And he did a number of oral history interviews. And I watched those. And in three of them, he talks about how they were doing radiation experiments on apex predators. And then those apex predators escaped and they couldn't recapture them. And so he tells the story of how they had um, 30 alligators. And he even holds up a picture of the device that they were using to irradiate these alligators with X radiation. And he says, yeah, so we were doing these experiments on these alligators. One night, six of these experimental apex predators uh, outsmarted the scientists and escaped into the Columbia River. So they had six irradiated alligators swimming around in the Columbia River with public has access to it. And there are contemporaneous newspaper articles because they put out a press release about it. So earlier, one of these gators had escaped. It was caught by a fisherman. Uh, it was killed, stuffed, and put into a sporting goods store. And then the Department of Energy, which runs Hanford, you know, confiscated it because the thing was radioactive and hot. And so they didn't want that to happen again. So they put out a press release that said these alligators have gotten into Columbia River. They spend six months trying to hunt these things down, and they only ever catch four of them. Right. So out of the six, <laughs> there's still two out there. And in these interviews, Bill Bear is saying, yeah, even into the 80s, I'm getting reports 
you know, fish and wildlife guys asking me if I know anything about gators in the Columbia River. And he just tells them no, and he laughs about it in the interview. And like, it's hilarious. Wow. So what's really clear is that they're doing experiments in apex predators. And you have to ask yourself, well, why the hell are they doing that? It's not like we use alligators as a food source or we alligator eggs or we milk alligators. Like, there's really no reason to be doing those kind of experiments in terms of any kind of national security. Weapons. Um, except for what they were doing with dolphins. So since 1958, the U.S. government has used trained dolphins to protect some of our most sensitive nuclear sites. In fact, in the 80s and 90s, over a quarter of the U.S. nuclear stockpile was guarded by dolphins. And the reason why is that so many of our nuclear sites, like, for instance, nuclear sub bases or any kind of reactors, they're always not going to be on a waterway because you need that cooling or for the subs, you need the access to the ocean. And like if you're worried about Soviet scuba divers coming in and sabotaging or surveilling your site, um, you can't really use sonar to detect them because a scuba diver is the same size as like a seal or a tuna or some other piece of marine life. But they learned in 1958 that you can train a dolphin to identify those guys. And so what they would do with these dolphins is they would attach a barb-like harpoon thing under their snout. And they'd train the dolphin that when they encountered an enemy diver, to ram that harpoon into their body and then a balloon would inflate and then it would bring that diver to the surface and then the Navy would scoop them up and, you know, gather intelligence from uh, whatever was left. You know, a dead diver at the bottom of the ocean doesn't tell you anything. And so a super effective program for the U.S. government as a way of safeguarding our most sensitive nuclear sites is employing animals to do that work. In fact, on Hanford, they had four Nike missile launch sites. A Nike missile is a surface-to-air nuclear-tipped anti-aircraft missile. And during the 50s and 60s, this was the primary way that they planned to defend sites like Hanford from Soviet bombers. So the idea was it's far better to detonate a nuclear warhead and take out bombers over U.S. civilian populations than to allow those bombers to bomb a place like Hanford. And Hanford had four of these sites on it the most of any site in the American defense structure. And each one of those sites was guarded by dogs. And what they said was a dog is worth 10 soldiers in terms of a sentinel role. Like they're that much more effective. So if your job is your cold warrior and your job is to defend Hanford, you've got a really big problem. There is 45 miles of the Columbia river running right through the middle of this site. When you combine, you know, uh, an east bank and a west bank, that's basically 90 miles of river coastline that you need to guard. Uh, and this is the country's number one nuclear site, Department of Energy. Nothing is more important than Hanford. You can't bring dolphins in here because the Columbia River is freshwater and dolphins only operate in salt water. So if you're a zealous cold warrior, you're going to ask yourself one really basic question. What is the world's most effective river hunter? Well, it turns out it's a black jaguar. Black jaguars can hold their breath for 15 minutes. They can eat underwater. They can swim a kilometer in the open ocean. They have night vision that's six times better than a human being. Coincidentally, they can kill alligators with a single bite to the back of the head. They're the strongest of the big cats, pound for pound, and they always instinctively drag their prey to shore. And so if you were looking for a base animal to create a uh, sentinel creature, the jaguar is your number one starting point, right? If you need to guard 90 miles of river coastline, you're going to pick an animal that has this array of super abilities. And what we think happened was that, um, so they were, they had a jaguar sentinel program. We think that perhaps that alligator program was also a sentinel program that didn't work out. We think that uh, they were, manipulating these creatures just like they were manipulating the alligators these creatures eventually outsmarted the scientists that were trying to contain them once those creatures escaped they couldn't recapture them and so if you look at the position of hanford in washington state if you go north south or uh, east of hanford you just go deeper into desert if you head west towards Klickitat County, this is a place that's got an enormous variety of habitats. There's tons of trees and available prey food sources. And so what we think happened was that they had a, 
a jaguar sentinel program where they were manipulating these creatures just like they were manipulating the gators. They eventually escaped and they headed west into Clickadet County. And that's why now we're seeing, uh, we've got over 80 reports of giant black panthers creeping around Clickadet County. Man, that makes so much sense. And it makes so much sense if you if you take that same thought process and apply it to different um, locations based on where things need to be protected, the animal that that animal that they would use would change. And so you would have a genetically modified wolf, you may have genetically modified crocodiles, you may have all kinds of stuff. And then you combine the fact in that just uh, two years ago, they were trying to work a bill through the Senate to stop them from doing genetic modifications. And um, it was a bill to stop what they were already doing. And they voted to keep it going. It makes all the sense in the world, man. I mean, it makes yeah. all the sense in the world. The other thing that's really interesting, you know, we've had no hostile encounters, and that to me is a real head scratcher. I mean, this is an enormous predator, right? Eight, you know, four feet tall to shoulder, bigger than a tiger. Why is it unafraid of humans? You know, cougars are terrified of humans. Well, if you had a sentinel creature, um, you would want it to be desensitized to human presence. Like it, it yep. shouldn't automatically attack humans. It should only attack humans under certain command words or certain conditions or whatever. And you'd want it to be completely familiar with people so that it, you know, um, was able to work with its handlers. And so, again, you know, we're trying to put together the pieces and we're missing half of them. Right. And so this is a really complicated puzzle. A lot of weird things going on here. But, you know, for my money, if you don't want to evoke some kind of supernatural explanation, you know, there's some type of extraterrestrial feline humanoid race or there's some type of um you know native american tradition of something that's come from the spirit world and you're just looking for okay hard nuts and bolts we're not looking for anything magical or spiritual this story about uh the hanford nuclear site um is one that seems to make a lot of sense now let me ask you this question this is how we'll know how close you are, if you get the nail on the head. Have you had any pushback since you started talking about that? You know, I really how many have. times have you talked about it publicly so far? At like on a uh, how many couple times? dozen times, a couple dozen times. Um, and like I said, today the report that we got, someone had heard me on another podcast, and they came in. This individual saw it um, leap. They were driving from Mount St. Helens. They saw it leap into the middle of the road and then took and jumped off um, onto the road. We've had other folks, you know, talk about when they when it jumps across the road, its body stretched out, you know, back paws to front paws reaches from the white line to the yellow line to the white line. So a really enormous creature. But to answer your question, um, you know, we haven't had uh, a, like if, if have government folks come and talk to me or anything like that. No, we haven't heard anything like that. All right. But I will tell you this. So Hanford is kind of just the beginning um in terms of government involvement in the area you can imagine with as much as much infrastructure we have here so if we're producing 44 percent of all the hydroelectric power in, in this country we've got this enormous waterway there's railways on either side of it like the columbia river gorge is an incredibly important strategic location right and so we see military choppers flying through the canyon all the time Sometimes folks have reported in the store that they have seen uh, highly advanced aircraft, like helicopters that don't make sound, things of that nature. We've had reports of multi-domain craft, you know, craft that is flying through the air, then dives into the river underwater, and yeah. continues underwater. We've had folks that say that while they were hiking, they were stopped by soldiers and told they couldn't enter certain areas. We've had areas that have been completely closed down uh, by government agencies. Um, there are some folks who've reported in the store that they believe that there is some type of multinational base near um, Mount Adams. This is the mountain where you know people come and watch UFOs fly around all the time. And so we do have this really um, high degree of government interest in the area. And that's just the way it's always been. And like I said, in the store, uh, we get reports and there's, uh, when we can follow up on them, we do, but we have had numerous reports of strange government activity in the area. I'll tell you what, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost out of time, but I'll tell you what, you know how you got all these guys 
that contact me. DW, I'm looking for a place to go investigate. You know a place? This area is the perfect place. It's got everything. It's got more bang for your buck than anything I've heard. And we only touched on this cat and a few UFOs. We didn't go into the humanoids. We didn't go into anything else that I've seen that, I mean, this place has all the bang for your buck that you could ever want as an investigator. James, tell everybody um, where's the address to the store. What's the address? So they want to come and they're in the area. They want to, to reach out yep. and come buy yep. something. So we are located in Bingen, Washington, and the biggest town close to us. So Bingen's got about 800 people in it. Not huge. Um, but uh, the closest town that people know about would be Hood River. It's right across the river from us. There's a big bridge. And you'd fly into Portland Airport, 60-minute drive, and you'd be in Hood River. And then another five minutes, you're over in Bingen. Uh, right there on the southern border of Washington State. Uh, check us out on you know Facebook, MargesOutdoorStore.com, or our website. And uh, that's really sort of the best way to keep track of what we're doing. Um, Facebook is a place where we do a lot of updates and things like that. But yeah, if you are in the area, uh, I'd be happy to point you in the direction of where a lot of these astonishing things occur. Um, you know, we, like I said, these, these interviews go so fast sometimes, and there's just so much content to cover. I've had some really uh -huh. unusual experiences myself, um, you know, things that I've seen uh, over by uh, Horse Thief Butte. There's an area here we call Brook Lake Barrows. It's a, basically a lava flow that's the size of the island of Manhattan, and people have gone missing in there, and I've had, you know, strange experiences of, you know, lost uh I guess I'd call it spatial and temporal displacement. So, time. yeah, and and was uh, transported. Uh, well, it's, it's a longer story than that, but basically, okay, let's, just, let's just go into the story. Let's just go. If you got a few more minutes, let's just hit the story because you're trying to squeeze it in. That ain't gonna work. All right, so we go to this All place. Right. So we lose time and we get moved around. So that's the summary. But go ahead, go into the details of it because this is crazy. All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> so Broke Leg Burrows is this really, all right, just to give you a sense, I have been a professional land navigator since I was 18 years old in the Army, right? So land navigation, compass, maps, uh, and then as a wild and forest firefighter, and then as a search and rescue EMT. So I am, uh, like I said, have been professionally land navigating my entire adult life. I have really good sense of direction. I know where I'm in, at in the wilderness. Like if you are out there, if you're the kind of person that they call when someone else is lost and hurt, you can't be getting lost and hurt yourself. You have to really right. be at the top of your game, right? Right. So Broke Lake Barrows is this lava flow. It's maybe 20 minutes from the store. And it's kind of up in the wilderness area, a place called the Indian Heaven Wilderness. And 8,000 years ago, this volcano erupted and just sort of filled up this entire mountain valley with this jumble of rocks. There are, you know, heat, like micro canyons and lava tube caves, this jumble of rocks and ridges. Honestly, it is the worst place that I've ever seen to navigate in. Um, and once you get in there, because of all these jumbled rocks that are covered with moss and everything, it's incredibly quiet. It's deathly quiet in there. And like I said, people have gone missing. They were just 20 yards from their companions and then vanished off the face of the earth. Hundreds of searchers go in there. No one finds a trace of them. And so I was up there doing some investigations and I was flying my drone um, down one of these little micro canyons. So imagine like the lava will flow and uh, it will form a crust on the top. The lava will continue to flow through until all the lava is gone. And then you get a cave, right? Because uh, right. that lava has sort of spilled out. And then that cave roof collapses. And so you get a trench. And so just for the sake of simplicity, um, uh, I'm a, maybe 150 yards from the edge of the lava bed. And I'm flying my drone up and down, like let's just say north and south up and down this trench, you know, getting some footage of it, stuff like that. I walk to the north end of the trench, I make a 90 degree turn, and I start walking uh, west, all right? So, uh, and I walk another 200 yards. Um, and then I find another trench and I say, oh, this is really great. And so basically when I turned west, I'm going deeper into the lava bed. Uh, and so I'm um, looking around and you have to understand when you are a professional land navigator, 
you are doing things like you're building mental maps. Um, it's really, really rare if I've been someplace that I, you know, wouldn't recognize it again. Uh, you're counting your paces, you're keeping an eye on, um, you know, important landmarks. Like there's a whole series of things that are going on in the background of your mind when you're land navigating. So I make that 90 degree turn, walk another 200 yards deeper into the lava field, find another trench. Like, oh, this is a cool trench. I think I'm going to fly the drone through here. And I'm there for five minutes. And I realize that I am at the south end of the original trench that I went to, right? So I've been transported easily 300 yards and uh, readjusted probably 110 degrees from the direction I thought I was going in. So for a person like me who has been, you know, who is the kind of guy that you call when someone else is lost and hurt, to be completely unaware of my surroundings and completely, you know, spatially displaced by over 300 yards, maybe even more, and then turned around, not even recognizing where I was, um, is a really uh, jarring moment. Like, what the hell just happened to me? And, you know, the if you were to imagine that there were uh, entities in this lava field, like, and no one goes in there. Like, if just to give you a sense of scope, the island of Manhattan houses 1.7 million people. This is an area the same size that could house 1.7 million people. And if you were an entity and you were trying to keep people out of there, this was perhaps like one of the most benevolent ways to do that, where you simply, you know, Move close their eyes for a second and we're going to put you back at go and, um, that's going to be it. Um, I think the reason why I spent so much time talking about my land navigation experience is for anyone else, you know, uh, <laughs> being lost in the woods or not knowing where you are or mistaking where you are might be a fairly common thing. For me, that never happens. Um, it's the kind of thing where, you know, if you were driving your car and suddenly you realized, you know, in your hometown and you realize it you were back where you started from after driving for a couple of miles. Like it's that same level of what the hell just happened here. And in the same area, we've had Bigfoot sightings, Bigfoot footprints. Uh, the ape cat's been seen up in this area. And I have a sense, and there are no trails in there. I should also tell you that compasses don't work in there. Cell phones don't work in there. My drone was having a hard time picking up GPS satellites. And so there are these places here, uh, obviously with this, jumble of volcanic rock the magnetism is off the charts another highly complex electromagnetic environment and like that's just one tiny area of over 2,000 square miles of like vast deep wilderness that's both desert and rainforest it's truly a remarkable place and if anybody is at all interested in paranormal investigation come out to marge's outdoor store in Bingen, washington we'll set you up we'll tell you where to go if I have time, I'll take you out there myself. But man, this is a place where I think it deserves more recognition. I think it's um, a place where uh, some mysteries can be, some real good data can be gathered. It seems like it, man. It happened. One more question. You were physically fine, though. No nosebleeds, no headaches, no nothing crazy. It's just like somebody said, okay, nosy person, you're here. We're going to put you right here. Get out of here. Just to give yeah. you make the point. And it was seamlessly edited too. Like I had no idea that I had been moved. It took me five minutes to come to my senses and realize it was only after I flew my drone and I looked over it and I could see the edge of my rig. Uh, I was like, holy crap, I am back where I started. Like how in the hell did this even happen? Um, and it wasn't, you know, there wasn't jarring. It wasn't like I felt violated or like any kind of right. weird thing. It was just, we're going to bumper car you over here and, that's going to be the deal. And so this place is, um, there's but one four wheel drive track into it. You can scratch into it maybe a quarter of a mile. And it's this, it's weird that there's any kind of road there at all because there's no commercial interest. There's no, you know, you don't log in there. There's no mining in there. And this road just leads to this collection of weird pools of water that are sort of filling up some sinkholes. And I was out there and um, there's a campfire spot and I found a bunch of 5.56 NATO cartridge rounds. So these are the expense cartridges. Right. And so in and of itself, not crazy AR 15 shoot 5.56. Um, but what was weird was that there were 
belt links. So, um, you know, when I was in the army, I, I was a squad gunner, had a M249 squad automatic weapon. It's a belt fed machine gun that uses 5.56 uh, ammo. And what's weird is that sure, civilians have 5.56 ammo, good old boys, yeah, well, belt in the woods. but it is illegal. Like no one has a belt fed AR-15. Like that's just not something that civilians are allowed to have. And when I looked at the pattern, it looked like they were firing in all directions. Again, you know, hard to say what I, a lot of these things are, I mean, I'm not going to stake my claim to say there's definitely some type of military presence, but we do know that during uh, 2000, 14 lost person out there they the military actually showed up to find this guy really unusual i mean i've been on as a search and rescue emt you know dozens and dozens of searches and the only time the military shows up is if like maybe there's a navy chopper that comes in or a coast guard chopper that comes in to help airlift somebody but you never get boots on the ground and here was this military unit uh searching for this guy so again there's a lot of strange things going on out here uh you know i think I'm just kind of scratching the surface of all of the strange phenomenon and all of the ways that these different organizations and entities and everything else are interacting out here. Nah, man, that's crazy. You know exactly what you're talking about. Um, that, that's crazy. Man. That's insane. All right, James, we're going to shut it down right here. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us. This was a phenomenal interview. And he touched on a new location for me that I knew nothing about. And now you have a brand new location where not only can you go to the store and shop, find someone who can be a guide. Um, I prefer if he just sends you to the location and one of them things pick you up and drop you somewhere and you can call me back and go, hey, so what is I went there and it picked me up and it dropped me and I get the story. But nonetheless, I think you should go. And in fact, bro, I'm going to be out there not too long from now. I want to say in August or September, I'm going to be out in that area going to some of the wineries. So I'm definitely going to pass through. And give you know, give me a call. I'll set you up. Yeah, I'm not going there though. I'm not, I don't play that. I already know. <laughs> but I don't need to be shifted in location and I don't need none of that. I'm cool. I don't need none of that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. It was great. Peace out.